Okay, let me uh, welcome everybody. We're getting a late start. I um, want to welcome you to this uh, special workshop and um, acknowledge that this represents a, a workshop in honor of uh, William K. Estes. There's an Estes fund that was established and in cooperation with both Psychonomics and the uh, Association for Psychological Science. And as a matter of fact, in May of next year at the APS meeting in San Francisco, there will be a related uh, session entitled From the Origins of Computer-Based Learning to MOOCs, a Symposium in Honor of William K. Estes. One highlight of that particular uh, symposium is that uh, Dick Atkinson is going to talk about the early work at Stanford, perhaps in some ways the first online learning exercise. But in case this meeting and that meeting are in honor of uh, Bill Estes, people have generously contributed to the Estes Fund. Today we're improvising a bit because our first speaker, Steve Jordans, uh, has not appeared. He's the one that we carefully arranged to have all the PowerPoints on his laptop. <laughs> he is also the one, only one of us who has actually created a MOOC. And he's from this city. He's from this city, and he's the most entertaining one of us. But we're hoping that he will make a uh, appearance. We're going to have to alter. Uh, the sequence of speakers. He was our beginner. So, uh, and the other thing I think we're going to have to alter given the late start and room change and stuff is we intended to make this highly interactive with uh, five minutes of discussion after each talk. I think now that we will have to uh, um, keep the speakers on time if we can and then have a discussion afterwards. Uh, I preferred that we don't do that because uh, that tends to be a discussion of the last paper due to recency effects. But in any case, uh, uh, so today uh, our first speaker, who was scheduled to be our second speaker but kindly uh, agreed to step in, is uh, Carl Spooner, who's going to talk about we're missing our title slide. <laughs> He's going to talk about improving attention and learning for video recorded lectures. Okay, uh, so thanks everyone for being here today. Um, thanks Janet and Bob and everyone else for putting this together. Uh, what I'd like to do today is just to give you a bit of an overview about some research that my collaborators and I have recently been working on that has to do with how well students are able to learn from video recorded lectures. Now, the reason why we've been so interested in learning from video recorded lectures is because they really do represent a central component to most online learning platforms. And that includes not only MOOCs, but also uh, very important sort of movements going on within universities that involve blended classrooms. And in each of these cases, instructors will upload standalone videos onto these platforms and students are expected to learn from them on their own time. And what we've become interested in is trying to understand what sorts of limitations or obstacles are students likely to encounter when they try to learn from these types of videos and what can we do to make that experience more effective for them. Uh, so for instance, in the ideal case, what we want is a student who is in front of their laptop or their desktop computer uh, who's learning from the video, and we want a situation when they're, where they are intently focused on the content of the learning experience. But we all know from our experiences as lecturers that students often find it difficult to sustain their attention for an extended period of time and that at some point in time their attention is going to wander to thoughts that are related to events that have nothing to do with the content of the lecture they're trying to learn from. 
Um, I think that this is a mental experience that we're all intimately familiar with. I'm sure over the next hour, each and every one of us will at least once have this experience. Um, and the reason why we think it's so relevant to online learning is because online learning really taxes the individual in a very strong way to regulate their own learning experience. In the classroom, we have the great advantage of being to, able to gauge how interested the student is. We know uh, when it's a good time to introduce a break. We know when it's a good time to ask a question to make sure that students are grasping key concepts. When students learn from these standalone videos, it's really up to them, and we don't have that power. And so what we want to figure out is what is a better way to structure these videos that can help to keep students focused on the content of the learning experience. So that is really the driving force behind some of the research that we've been getting involved in. Um, and what we've been focusing on are really two key elements of most lectures that we think might be important to think about. Uh, one of those elements uh, has simply to do with the length of lectures. Most lectures are rather long, ranging anywhere between 40 to 60, even 120 minutes. And for a long time, educators have stressed that it's a very bad idea to have students just sit through an extended study sequence like this. And what you really want to do is mix or change up the lectures with various activities to try to keep students engaged. Unfortunately, there's just not that much research out there suggesting what activities work, what activities don't. And so that's what we really started to think about. We want to sort of break up the lectures into more manageable segments, but what do we interpolate those lectures with to sort of help keep students effectively engaged? And our initial thought was to think about evaluation. And what I mean by that is that in most lecture situations, whether it's online or in our classrooms, Students know that as they sit through the lecture, they're not responsible for that information until some later point in time, usually until a midterm that's a few weeks down the road. If they're lucky, they have an instructor who might give them a quiz at the end of the lecture. But for the most part, they know that as they sit through the lecture, they're not really responsible for that information. And so what we thought is if we're already going to be breaking down the lectures into more manageable segments, why not interpolate them with brief memory tests and set up a situation where the student realizes, well, if I'm responsible for this five to 10 minutes from now, maybe I should pay a little more attention to what's happening. And we just wanted to see, will that help to make students more effective learners uh, in this context? Okay. So what we did is we just simply took a 20 minute excerpt of an intro to statistics lecture that is offered through the Department of Economics at Harvard University. And we brought in undergraduates. And basically what we told them is they're going to watch this 20 minute video. And that as they're watching from the video, they're going to notice that the video is going to be divided into four segments that are roughly five minutes each. And we told them the reason we're doing this is that we didn't want to overwhelm them with the content that they're going to be exposed to, just make it a little easier on them. <clears throat> and then what we told them too is that during each break point, they're going to complete two activities. The first activity was just to answer some math problems that are actually completely unrelated to the lecture. We just told them, we just want to get your mind off the lecture for a moment, just give you a bit of a mental break. And then when you complete the math problems, we're going to ask you to do one of two things. Either you're going to complete a few more math problems, or we're going to give you a few questions about the segment of the lecture that you had just learned. Okay? Now the important thing here is that we told students that the number of times we were going to test them was going to be determined randomly by a computer program, such that they could be tested after each and every one of the four segments of the lecture. They might only be tested after one or two of the segments, um, or they might never be tested. But they never knew how often it, was, it would happen, so it was to their benefit to try to learn each segment of the lecture as well as they could. And then finally, just in case that wasn't enough, we told them that there would be a final cumulative test that would test their knowledge about the entire lecture, regardless of how often we had tested them. So again, it would be to their benefit to try to learn from the lecture as well as they could. All right, so everyone gets these instructions. In reality, we actually have two groups of participants, or at least two groups that I'm going to have time to tell you about today. And uh, what, uh, what the way that these two groups differ is as follows. For one group, we actually give them a quiz or a test after each and every one of the four segments of the lecture. And we can call this group our tested group. For the second group of participants, we actually only ever give them a test following the fourth and final segment of the lecture. And for the lack of a better term, we can call this group our non-tested group. 
And what this allows us to do is now evaluate some features of the students' experiences as they're learning from the lecture. The first one I want to mention, and we're actually going to come back to this a little later on, but I just figure I'll prime you with it now. What this design allows us to do is to see how well are students learning from this fourth and final segment of the lecture, where we know students typically have a lot of trouble absorbing information. Whenever you have students sit down and learn from an ex extended study sequence, whatever that sequence is, and the lecture just represents a very good example of that, students have a lot of trouble absorbing information when they get to the, end, to, the, to the end of these sequences. And what we can see here is does interpolated testing help you learn when you get to the end of that sequence? So we'll come back to that in a moment. But what I want to focus on first is how will our students paying attention in this context? And so what we did here, at the outset of the study, we actually told the participant that there's going to be an experimenter in the room with them. And that every now and then, the experimenter is going to ask, do you happen to be mind wandering right now? And the student never knew how many times they would get this question. All they knew is that any time they heard this question, they would just have to write down yes or no on a piece of paper. And the way that it worked is at one random point during each segment of the lecture, the experimenter would ask this question. Okay. And so what this allows us to do now is to see this interpolated testing during the lecture helps students to avoid bouts of mind wandering as they're watching from the lecture. Okay, so we can just jump right into the data and we're gonna look at the mind wandering first. And what I wanna focus on first is what is happening with the non-tested group? How often do they report mind wandering during the lecture? And what we see is 40% of the time they report having this experience. Now to us, this was a very sobering data point for two reasons. First, it really made us think, what in the world are participants doing when they come into our experiments? <laughs> and the reason I say that is because remember, the experimenters in the room with them and the participant knows that they're going to be checking their attention throughout the task. And still, 40% of the time, they can't help but have this mental experience. The second reason why we think that this type of data is a little alarming is because when you look at studies of mind wandering in actual classrooms, you see estimates that are maybe not quite this high, but they're still pretty high. And so it's a very common phenomenon uh, that people experience in these types of educational settings. So what can we do to sort of try to reduce the occurrence of mind wandering? And would testing help? And so in this study, what we found is that absolutely it did. We were able to cut mind wandering in half to about 19%. And we've been able to replicate this basic pattern of results a number of times in our lab now. And each time we're able to cut mind wandering in about half. Now what we can do too is we can take a look at this data in a little more detail to see or try to get a sense of when is mind wandering really ramping up for the group that's not being tested. And in order to do that, we can just take a look at what's the occurrence of mind wandering during each and every one of the four segments of the lecture. Now keep in mind that we're not counterbalancing the order of the lecture segments, so we have to interpret this with a little bit of caution. But the comparison here is between participants, so I think we can take some uh, information away from this. The first thing we can think about is what's happening during that first segment of the lecture. Remember, participants in both groups get the exact same instructions, so we wouldn't expect any differences, whether it's mind wandering or anything else, because they're going into the task with the same expectations. And that's pretty much exactly what we see. There's very low levels of mind wandering uh, for the two groups and really no differences at all. But then remember, after they're done that first segment, there's a break between the two groups. For one of the groups, they get a test, and then this idea that I may or may not be tested is reinforced with an actual test. For the other group, they don't get the test, and all of a sudden there's a possibility, oh, I may not be tested. And does that have any influence on the frequency of mind wandering as they progress through the lecture? So we can look to see what's happening during the second segment, and now this is what we see. And we see all of a sudden, people who do, are not reinforced with that test, that expectation is not reinforced, all of a sudden, mind wandering uh, sees a dramatic jump. And when we go through the rest of the lecture, we see that it's not really going any higher than that, at least in this study that we saw. We've actually replicated this pattern a few times in our lab uh, with different populations. And so this idea that you, know, you can have people be sort of on the hook for something in the lecture, but if you're not reinforcing that in some way, um, they ease up just a little bit and for some reason mind wandering uh, sees a huge spike. 
Okay. And before I leave the data, another thing I want to do, I just want to highlight that interpolated testing has a lot of other advantages other than just helping people to avoid bouts of mind wandering. So for instance, when we look at students' propensity to take notes during the lecture, and we take their lecture slides and we just see for what proportion of the slides do they take additional notes, we see that students who are being repeatedly tested are th more than three times as likely to be taking additional notes. Um, and you know, these are gigantic effect sizes and it's, you know, it's a very impressive thing that we're seeing. And then remember earlier how I said that with this design we can check to see how well are students learning from the end of the lecture, especially like the location of the lecture where we know they tend to have a lot of difficulty. And what we see there as well is that just the simple act of testing people on earlier parts of the lecture uh, really helps them to learn from the end of the lecture. And so not only is interpolated testing helping people to avoid bouts of mind wandering, they're becoming more engaged with the learning experience, and they're effectively becoming better learners. Okay. And so even though I'm not going to have time to tell you about some of the other studies we've done, I will just briefly mention that we've done some experiments to rule out the possibility that our uh, testing manipulation has anything to do with the fact that people are being re-exposed to lecture content during the test. We've sort of taken care of that. We know that does, that's not driving the results. Uh, and we've also uh, run conditions where we rule out the possibility that the fact that people in the tested group get questions that might cue them into the types of things they should be paying attention to the lecture. Uh, we have control conditions that rule out that possibility. And it really seems that what you need to be doing is not only testing people during the lectures, but sort of upholding the expectation that they will be tested. Um, and for those of you interested in, in that line of work, Jana Weinstein uh, has just published a really nice paper in JPLMC where she uh, really fleshes some of this stuff out. Uh, and so just to conclude, I just want to acknowledge Dan Schachter and then also uh, Noval Khan and Helen Jin, uh, who have been very instrumental in getting all this research done. Uh, and then also the Harvard Initiative for Learning and Teaching, uh, which has been uh, critical to helping us get this research off the ground. Um, so, thanks. While we're getting uh, Janet set up, is there a burning or smoldering question? <laughs> right here. Yeah. 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 So we have done that. So there's a very strong negative correlation between mind wandering and performance. Um, we also look at what exactly they're mind wandering about. Usually, it's about future events. We usually think about future simulation as a very adaptive thing that we do. I think this is a context we can actually hurt people, especially when you look to see what they're mind wandering about. Um, and then, and what was the first part of that question? Well, just to see if it's fully uh, wandered away from the task. Yeah. When I'm talking right. to some of my students about mind wandering, other uh, participants about mind wandering, they bring up something like, oh, I was thinking I was hungry, but yeah. it doesn't keep them from. Exactly. Yeah, no, no, we give them very clear instructions about what it means, and then we, we, we check to see what they actually write in some experiments we've done to make sure they actually were. Um, and in our instructions, we always make sure to stress that, you know, it's okay if you're mind wandering. Um, we want to know what's happening in these contexts so that we can help you become a better learner. And that becomes very important when we've done some of this with older adults, and they usually don't want to sort of admit that they might be doing that when it's not something that's, uh, you know, that it's a good thing to do, and so we always give the instruction that, you know, just be as honest as you can because that's what we're trying to do, and, and it seems to work pretty well. And do you think okay. this is still conservative, considering you did have the presence of an experiment in the room, and these sort of yeah. online learning situations? Yeah. We've, we've done this with and without the experimenter, <clears throat> and there's no difference, and in, in our study, we're actually underestimating because the data I showed you includes that first segment, which we should really be excluding because there's no difference there. Yeah. Thanks so much, Carl. Those great results. So that will explain why we have intermittent quizzes scheduled for the rest of this workshop. <laughs> uh, I, one thing I forgot as chair is when we do have questions, they're recording, filming this workshop. We should have you come to the mic over there with the questions. Now we're pretty much in a position of having to hold them till the end of uh, all the talks.
And the next one, the uh, next talk is by Janet Metcalf, and I do want to say that Janet's actually the driving force be behind creating this workshop and the APS workshop, lest uh, someone think that I was the driving force. It's Janet. <laughs> and uh, Janet is going to talk about on the hook online. Janet. Okay. Actually, the idea was Bobby Klatsky's, so credit where credit's due. Um, okay, I'm going to talk about On the Hook Online, and um, I want to mention that MOOCs are a really new thing. So they've only been around for about a year and a half, maybe two years, and they're attracting millions of students across the world. Um, the, we don't have very much data on them as yet. The first paper that came out on the first MOOC, which was an MIT MOOC, or an engineering course, was published last summer by Breslau and her colleagues. And uh, so I'm going to just start by giving you a little summary about what those results were. Um, in that MOOC, 154,763 students enrolled. So if you're a, a professor teaching a class, that's your class, right? It's enormous. Um, Every week there was a lecture sequence, so they had a sequence, and actually the, they were broken down into fairly small lectures. Um, there were, so there was, a whole, there, there was a whole series of them. There were online exercises. There were tutorials, pre-recorded tutorials online. Uh, there was an online textbook. There was a discussion forum that kids, the students could log into, and there was a wiki. Everything could be accessed whenever and as often as the student wanted to. So you could get at this at 12 o'clock at night if you wanted to, it was fine. And they took demographic and motivational surveys. The students were from 194 countries, so this is truly going all over the world. The US was the top, um, India was second, and the Spain was actually number five. So most of the students were English. Most of the students were in their 20s, although the age ranged from teenagers to septuagenarians. So it was open to everyone. Um, they recorded every mouse click. And there were over 230 million interactions for this MOOC. So that's the database that they have going into it. The grades in this class were based on homework assignments, 15%, lab assignments, a midterm, and a final exam. Everything was open book. So you could, while you were taking the final exam, you could be accessing the lecture. You could be accessing anything you wanted, okay? So the first question that we might have about learning is, is it really learning, or is it just learning to access things? Um, and assignments could be taken, again, retaken as often as students wanted to. To pass this class, a student had to get a grade of 60%. You fail in my class if you get a 60%. <laughs> I don't know about you. And my class is an open book. Um, over, slightly over 7,100 students passed. That's 4.5%. Okay? And so, and this is the survival function. The psychologists will love the survival function, right? So over time, you can see how many students were in the class. And as you can see, it drops right off. OK, so it seems to have tremendous potential to reach a lot of people. You know, students in the Yukon who can't make it to university could take these classes, MIT classes, Stanford, Harvard. but we're not sure how to make it work. So it has both big, uh, big, huge potential upside and a big downside. The, they took correlations on a whole lot of variables. Um, the strongest correlation between student achievement, student achievement was the grade they got, and measured factors. Indeed, this was the only correlation that they got, except for how, good, how much math you had going into the class. And it was an engineering class. And that was a marginal effect. The biggest correlation was whether the student worked offline with anyone on the MITx, that's the course, material. So the biggest predictor was personal face-to-face -face contact with a human being. 
most students didn't do this, but if they did, their grades were better. So that's where I started with this project that I'm going to tell you about that's only at the very beginning. And that is, oh, oh and the author said, we know about on-campus instruction, that collaborating with another person, whether novice or expert, strengthens learning. I'm not so sure we know that, but they claim we know that. Um, okay, so it looks like perhaps getting some kind of personal interaction that could be done online would be a really important thing to do. Um, so, and the lack of interaction is targeted as the main weakness. And for brick and mortar classes, maybe the main strength that we have if we're not so fond of the idea of MOOCs taking over everything, that's our, um, that, that's our advantage. Um, and from this first published study, it seems to matter for achievement. So we s sought to find a way to get person-to-person -person online um, contact. And the way we did this was by using uh, multiple Skype. So, uh, and we're, we're, we start very small, but there's no reason why you can't have three people logging on to Skype. And we had it with a tutor who was asking questions, and three people would be, and they could, one could be from India and one from the Yukon. I mean, they don't have to be in the room. We, in fact, ran it in our lab, but we ran it on Skype. Um, we wanted to talk to people afterwards and so on. Now, one problem with, which is a very difficult problem, actually, with having many people being tutored at the same time is to get individual participation. And uh, so what we wanted to do is something that we're going to call put people on the hook um, in order to get that kind of participation. And I first heard about uh, on the hook from Hal Paschler who told me about, who's also doing work on On the Hook, he told me about a high school, Waterford High School, in uh, the Central Valley in California, which was a very bad high school. And they decided to turn it around. And the principal made the teachers put the student's name in a popsicle, all on popsicle sticks and put them in a cup and ask questions and pull randomly the stick. So I'd ask a question and say, Nate, after I'd asked the question. But while I was asking the question, you didn't know if I was going to pick on you who would be on the popsicle stick, right? And so what happened ostensibly, the school turned around. So the school became a, a very excellent school. And one reason may be because the students became very engaged. The first day they hated it, but then afterwards they geared up their act, okay? And it, it was that kind of participation and engagement is something that we tried to simulate in our Skype simulation. Okay, we had uh, three experimental uh, conditions in our experiment. Um, we had three people on Skype with a tutor, and I'll show you some examples of this. We had the call on condition, which is a fairly traditional way that I say, in advance, I say the name of the person, or the number of the person in this case, and then read the question, okay? Now that's even a little better than what we usually do, which is let people ask the question and let whoever wants to answer, answer. It's a little better probably than that. We had a hook condition where we asked the question not saying who was going to answer and then designated randomly who would answer. And we had a listen condition where we just read the question and the answer. There was an immediate test and there was a delayed test. And the materials that we've used, we used, we've used quite a few times before. They were general information, i.e. trivia questions. And we would just look at their learning in the uh, immediate or delayed test. So we, we would give feedback and then look at the learning either immediately or at a week's delay. And we did them as separate experiments. Now, if this works, I will be able to show you. Hey, this is called What U.S. state has two towns named Evening Shade? Arkansas. B. What is the name of the aircraft carrier lost at the Battle of Mid that was found in 1998 by Robert Ballard? No idea. Yorktown. 
C. What is the last name of the composer who wrote the opera Don Giovanni? Uh, Mozart. Mozart. A. What is the last name of the artist who painted American Gothic? Wood. Okay, here's the listen condition. Um. A. What U.S. state oh, has two towns named E. I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah. That's a little too immediate. It's a little too immediate. But it's good that you're paying attention and not to... And you weren't the last to name of the actor who thanked his parents for not practicing birth control upon picking up a 1979 Best Actor Oscar is Hoffman. The name of the mythical bird that destroys itself on a burning altar so that a new bird can emerge from the ashes is Phoenix. Okay, that's the listen condition. And now this is the hook condition. So what she's doing is asking the question without saying who will answer it. And it's very simple manipulation. What is the palace built in France by King Louis XIV? B. Versailles. Versailles. What is the last name of the second U.S. president? C. Lincoln? I don't know. Adams. <laughs> what is the last name of the husband-wife spies who were electrocuted in 1951 for passing atomic secrets on to Russia? A. I don't know. Rosenberg. Okay, um, so our results. Well, we got an on the hook effect. So as you can see in the left, uh, for the left two bars, we divided it into whether you were the person who had to answer or it was the other person, okay? And what you see is that if it was the self and you were on the hook, you did well, this immediate test. If it was the other and you were on the hook, you also did well. If you were in the call on condition, if you were the person who was called on, you did well, but not, it wasn't so good if you weren't. In the listen condition, you're wondering why I'm doing this. The listen condition was just as good as the hook condition, but this was immediate test. And this, I think, is just like the study, the listen condition is just like the study condition. And you see in many, many test uh, studies that studying immediately is just as good. What about at a delay? So experiment two was conducted at a one-week delay. We lost, the hook condition was the best. And it, it, it was for both the self and the other. But it looks to me like over the week, if you were the one even in the hook condition, you perseverated over those answers and you worried about them because you did very well the self. But the other did pretty well too. In the call on, we got a standard generate effect. And in the listen condition, it was just like being the person who wasn't asked in the call on condition. Okay? So it looks like being on the hook is good, both immediate and at a delay. And it's a really simple thing to do. You can do it in your classroom, and you can do it online with the Skype. Before going on to the next phase, the next phase we wanted to be able to transfer this into an online situation without having to have Judy read the questions and be there. So we wanted to give the questions automatically and just let the three people interact. But we decided we better check to make sure that this having these people present was actually working. It turned out that we had done many experiments with this paradigm, and we had an equivalent in, on the computer experiment where you present the question in text, you let them answer, and you give the answer as feedback. And so we compared that, and here's what we got. The red line is the laboratory no Skype condition immediately. And at a delay, and so there's really not an advantage to the Skype for learning. And at a delay, being on the hook is just as good as doing it yourself. And that's pretty good because, you know, you were answering 
well, that's pretty good. Um, but <clears throat> the conclusion, the biggest problem with having multiple learners study together online is that while the person who generates the response, right or wrong, gets a long-term benefit, and I think it's a testing effect, those who do not generate do not learn so well. You can be really passive in that situation, even with other people present. This deficit can be partially offset by putting everyone on the hook, by not saying in advance who will answer. But it can also be overcome by having text-based questions. You don't really need the people from our data. So it's fairly easy to construct a situation where students could interact. And there might be lots of reasons for do, doing that. I mean, people might like the course better. They might stay on the course better. They might make friends. They could meet their future love. Who knows, right? With all, all the reasons for going to university, right? The social reasons. Those might apply. But, um, one of the, the, but we were looking at whether learning is a reason for doing it. And our data suggests that it's not. I think we uh, have a couple minutes for questions. Anybody would like to come up to the mic uh, with a question for Janet while well, Roddy's getting set up? <clears throat> You're going to ask question, Mark? <laughs> You're going to help Roddy, okay. Yeah. I don't think it actually matters much, but your listen condition was phrased differently to your other two conditions. Rather than saying what you said was the phoenix was the bird that sacrificed itself, instead yeah. of what was the bird that sacrificed itself, answer phoenix. Yeah, we thought a lot about that because um, we had done some studies before where if you ask a question and then you give a little pause after the question, it's just like being on the hook and then you give the answer. So we wanted to just have it be a, the, a kind of tutorial fact, the way a TA would do it in a classroom situation, where they just tell you, here's the answer. So, you know, we, we could fool around with that, but that's why we did it the way we did it. Yes? Would uh, there have been a different result if the group had been interacting over a problem and trying to discuss a solution? Because that's where at MIT they think the benefit comes. Yeah that if you work with somebody to a solution, you're both guessing, and then yeah. somebody offers an idea, that you get a very great advantage from working in the group. Yeah. You seem to be testing simply factual knowledge. Yeah. Yeah. And I think these, the I real think question should, is I, how I, to I, learn you know, how to do problems. You're absolutely right, but it needs to be tested. And we're at the very early stages of being able to do any kind of testing in this situation. So we've, you know, the Skype thing would allow you to do that. You could get four people online to really be a discussion group. That's and what I, I would look forward to. That so I would lobby for the data. Like, let's get the data and find out. Okay, in terms of finding out, um, <laughs> the next two talks um, represent uh, basically work on what's an alternative to MOOCs. And the first of those by Roddy Rodiger, Semester Online, Personalized Online Education. Thanks, Bob, and thanks to uh, all of you for being here. Um, the, uh, I was invited to come talk about MOOCs at the symposium, and the fact that I knew nothing about MOOCs didn't stand in my way, because uh, we'll, uh, as we'll see, uh, Mark and I do it up. Uh, the question, I want to broaden the question a little bit. We're assuming MOOCs are the answer, but first, what is the question? Uh, the question really is, what, what will online learning will it really revolutionize education? And certainly there are a lot of people who think so. If you just look at the newspaper headlines, uh, the hidden revolution in online learning, it's not very hidden anymore, um, <laughs> and college may never be the same, and then the last one I like, online courses look for a business model. Because right now we don't have one. Uh, right? Um, there, there isn't one. And I use the analogy to where we are right now. There's all this excitement about online education. And I remember back to the early 1980s, and there was a lot of excitement about personal computers. Computers, when I was growing up, filled a room this size. 
And the idea that you would have a personal computer was totally revolutionary, that something that somebody would have. And people in the computer industry, not everybody was enthusiastic. There's this famous quote uh, from the president of uh, uh, Digital Equipment Corporation, Jack, that said, uh, there's no reason anyone would want to have a computer in their home. <laughs> and now we carry them around in our pockets. Uh, so um, the other thing it reminds me of, I, I hope this will happen, is back when personal computers were just starting, it was totally up in the air. There were just dozens and dozens of companies. I'll just put up a few here. This is just a subset of the companies that were out there. Uh, things like uh, Chromemco, uh, uh, TRS, which was Radio Shack, uh, Commodore, and so forth and so on. I was at Purdue University at the time, and uh, our, one of our colleagues in psychology, who was one of our computer whizzes, he picked the next winner. He said, here's what we should do. Our whole department in general, and you in particular pointing at me, should buy uh, the leading edge. <laughs> So I bought the leading edge for $3,000 or whatever it cost, uh, and our department bought a whole bunch of the leading edges, and the leading edge went belly up. About a year later, they were all doorstops. But nobody knew back then that uh, uh, Apple, not Apple II, but Apple in general, and IBM PCs would be the two that won, because there were all these competing models. Now, I think the right way to think about online education today is we should have a whole lot of competing models out there, various types of MOOCs, various types of other things, and see what works, evaluate them, what's going to win eventually. Uh, so the other question is, education, there's no more conservative group in the world, I think, than college professors. I know we all, the public sees us as wild-eyed liberal radicals, but we really never change. We've been lecturing for 200 years, 200 years from now, we might still be lecturing. Uh, and I say that because I've been through, I've now lived through all kinds of revolutions in university education. Television in the 1950s was supposed to do what MOOCs do, MOOCs are doing, supposed to do now. After all, we could all watch one great professor on TV. Why not? Uh, didn't happen. Teaching machines came out of psychology, B.F. Skinner and others, and it dates back to the 1920s. Program learning, I have program learning textbooks, I won't tell you what they are. Uh, Keller plan was another idea, which I think is actually a pretty good idea. And then the teaching company came along, I don't know, 15 years ago, where they have these beautiful videotape uh, packets you can buy, you see ads for them all the time. All of those things were supposed to revolutionize university education, and yet we resisted. We're still doing the same thing. So none of these changed the world of higher education, but Everybody tells me now it's different. Now we have MOOCs. Uh, so MOOCs right now, um, the three main uh, varieties are Coursera, edX, and Udacity. Uh, there's no credit at the moment for most of them. There are a few experiments giving credit. Uh, they're open enrollment, as we just heard Janet go. You know, uh, 150,000 people start out and four finish, and we consider that a success. Uh, <laughs> They're free, that's a tough business model to sustain. How are they going so far? Well, three incredibly rich universities are putting them all on, MIT, Harvard, and Stanford. And they cost about 50 to 150,000 to put on a good MOOC. It's not a very sustainable business plan, um, but it might work, because we have really rich universities behind it. And they're so-called asynchronous, meaning for most of them, you just sit at home and you can watch them anytime, whether it's 3 in the morning or 2 in the afternoon. And then we're just experimenting, as Janet talked about, how to make them more interactive. Now, they might work great. I don't have anything against MOOCs at all. I don't know much about them. Um, but the, the, nobody's figured out how to make money off of them yet and how really to give credit. And people are just working on those problems. Um, Really, if you think about online learning, though, it's been around since the 1980s and 1990s. At my university has been giving a master's in biology to high school teachers. They come in the summers and they take courses online during the winters, and it takes them three or four years uh, for high school biology teachers. We've been doing that. And lots of universities have been doing online stuff for a long time now. It's not just University of Phoenix. It's most of our universities have been doing something online. So MOOCs are a continuation. 
What I want to talk about here is uh, a new experiment just started this fall called Semester Online. Uh, it is uh, now involves 10 universities, including my own. I've been involved with this since uh, way before it started when we were just planning it. Uh, here are the 10 universities that right now are involved. A few others might sign up soon. Um, so it's uh, mostly private American universities. There's one in Ireland, one in Australia, uh, and one public university, University of North Carolina. Uh, it's, we partnered with a company called 2U, which now runs some graduate programs, uh, but doesn't have undergraduate programs. So what is Semester Online? Just to give you a, uh, these are courses that are taught by regular professors in the universities. Uh, they're not part of their teaching load. They do it as an overload. They're paid to do it. Um, and um, there are, uh, the company, 2U, produces these very high quality asynchronous segments. This is not just a professor up standing in front of a lecture class. It's more like watching a TV show. You watch somebody up close talking to you, and it very, seems very personal, even the asynchronous parts. They don't film like an hour and a half lecture or an hour lecture. They film in little bits, 10 to 20 minute segments, and then you can watch those uh, on your own time. You, of course, have reading assignments to do. The main thing about it is there is a discussion group that uh, to you has a platform where you can see up to 20 people simultaneously. So you're there on your computer screen. And like Janet said, these people could be all over at any of these universities. And in fact, there's a way for people to enroll uh, if there are other universities too. And these are very well produced. The company knows what it's doing. It's been producing graduate level education for a while. And so they look pretty sharp. Uh, unlike MOOCs, these are for credit. These, uh, if you are at Washington University and you take a course at University at uh, Dublin uh, College in Ireland, uh, Trinity College, uh, Dublin in Ireland, you get credit for it. Um, you also pay tuition. This is not free. The course is about $4,000. But if you're a Washington University student, you don't pay any extra for it. If you're from some outside university and you come in, the student does pay or the university pays. Uh, there are relatively small classes. The sections don't go higher than 20. Right now, they're under 20. So, uh, and people are always on the hook. If you've ever done a Google Hangout, you know your face is right there, and you're on the hook all the time. You can't be doing your email or Facebook or whatever else. Uh, and so there's live instruction for half the course. And so this is just getting started. Um, we, uh, oh, uh, here, here, next semester, here are the course, some of the courses being offered. There's something like 15. I just picked out a few. How to Rule the World is being taught by a professor at Boston College. Shakespeare and Film by somebody at Notre Dame. Uh, baseball in American Culture, of course, I would like to take uh, out of a history professor at uh, Emory. Uh, Ireland in Rebellion, Trinity College, uh, Critical Earth Issues, a geoscientist at Washington University. Electronics out of the box from Northwestern, and Introduction to Bioethics. This is just a selection. There are others from all the other uh, places. So um, why are we doing this? Um, well, we're hoping to explore new pedagogical initiatives. This is another version of online learning. Um, we're obviously the universities hope to expand their visibility and impact. Same thing as with MOOCs, but this is on a much smaller scale. However, this scale is scalable and it's financially, uh, the financial model, if we get enough students, will work. Um, we don't know if we'll get enough students, of course. The, uh, we're going to try to evaluate the learning outcomes. Mark is going to talk about that in a moment. And the real hope is to enrich the university experience. And if we don't have a course on the Irish rebellions at Washington University, this is a way for our students who might want to do that to take it. Um, but we are giving courses now, not degrees. That most of the universities involved have a limit. It's like a transfer course, like you can go take one in the summer somewhere else. Well, this is, most of the universities are treating this as transfer credit. Uh, will this work? When I give this talk at Washington University, and this has created uh, somewhat of an uproar on our campus. Some people are very much for it, think it's the way to the future. Others think, uh, you know, as I say, college professors are conservative people. Uh, a lot of people think this is terrible. We should we're, uh, be smirching our brand by putting things online. 
Uh, and I have no idea. So when you think of uh, uh, Washington University, my own home school, and this, I, I don't know where the intersection will be. Will these two go together? Will they pull apart? Uh, will this revolution fail like all the other revolutions in higher education? I don't know. Uh, how do we know if it's going to work? Well, right now we've got anecdotes. This is a USA Today article where they interviewed some Emory students and they found an Emory student who just loved the course she was taking and semester online. But obviously anecdotes are not data and so Mark McDaniel is going to talk about uh, evaluation of how in general and of semester online in particular. He's in charge of our efforts at evaluation at Washington University. Okay, thanks. Also, I apologize if I have to leave a little bit early because I'm going, I've got to be speaking at 1.30 in another session. Yeah, but we do have time for a couple questions before Roddy has to run. Uh, again, I uh, can come to the mic if you have a, I guess I have one. Um, Go to the mic. Okay. <laughs> uh, so, when they sign up for this, um, I guess I'm un unsure how it works. This is taken from a regular class. Uh, uh, these lectures are someone's adapting from their regular class. Yeah, the question is, are, are people adapting to regular classes? In most cases, they are. Uh, in a few cases, they're combining a couple of classes they've done before. But the critical earth issues one is going to be a kind of a combination of two classes that our geoscience professor, uh, he teaches a course called Ring of Fire, Rings of Fire. It's about volcanoes and uh, things that go boom in the geological world. Uh, so he's going to combine some of that with another course he teaches. Uh, so, but most of them are doing the same course. Back at the mic. Yeah. I think one question is, what is the likelihood of having data about the efficacy of MOOCs and courses of the type you talked about available before boards of trustees and legislatures force everyone into doing this sort of education? Yes, good question, and I hope Mark is going to answer that. Because <laughs> uh, that's what he's going to be talking about, is evaluation of all of this. Because we're great at coming up with new things. I mean, when I talk to teachers, they flip classrooms. I, I, hey, aren't flipped classrooms great? I don't know. Is there any evidence that flipped classrooms are great? I don't know of any. But yes, it's such a great idea. I mean, how could it not be true? Well, that's what Mark, Mark is evaluating with us, sir. So Mark has been duly advertised and introduced. Mark. <laughs> Thank you. Can you hear me? Is, is this mic working? Yes. Okay, good. Well, as Roddy mentioned, the Semester Online Initiative of WashU has created a big uproar and there's been vigorously expressed concern from our faculty about the effectiveness of the online courses relative to face-to-face -face courses. And this, this kind of concern is probably present in your own institutions and it may be concerns you yourself have raised. Um, and the thinking is that, it's thinking uh, like Carl Spooner mentioned and Janet Metcalf, that in face-to-face -face courses, instructors can gauge the student's attention, they can gauge the student's understanding, can change the pace of the lecture if need be. Uh, even motions around the room can be attention grabbing and you wouldn't get that in the online course necessarily. Uh, Janet mentioned the social interaction in the classroom. Some people think that that's important for learning. So the basic idea is that there are a lot of reasons why online courses might not be as effective as face-to-face -face courses. And uh, I've been charged as uh, part of my center at WashU that we just uh, inaugurated a couple years ago, Center for Integrative Research on Cognition, Learning and Instruction, with trying to evaluate the WashU initiative. So as an experimental psychologist, I have a wish list as to what we'd want to do in evaluating these things. All of us have, I think, a similar wish list. And that would be, uh, well, this isn't, this isn't appearing well at all. <laughs> okay, boy, oh boy. Uh, okay, well, uh, so uh, one, the first thing we want is a comparable online 
and face-to-face -face course. And by comparability, I mean you'd want to use similar PowerPoints, if not identical PowerPoints. Uh, you'd want to use identical syllabi. You'd want similar work assignments. Uh, you'd want the same instructors, if it's a team taught, or the same instructor, if not. You'd like to have students from the same population. And that's one of the challenges in evaluating the MOOCs. As Janet mentioned, these are people from all over the world, all different circumstances. You can evaluate the MOOC against your students at Harvard. I don't think that's going to work very well. You'd like random assignment, if you could. You'd like to do a true experiment. You'd like your outcome assessments to be comparable. Ideally, you'd like identical outcome assessments in both classes. And in addition, it may be that the courses are somewhat comparable in achievement. However, the student reactions can be quite different. So ideally, we'd also want to hear what the students are thinking and responding to in the different kinds of classes. So it seems like a big challenge to set up this kind of evaluation. But it turns out it's not the impossible dream. And what I want to do is tell you, it, 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 surprising to me, that, and uh, pertinent to this question that, uh, 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 at the end of Roddy's talk, there is a literature on evaluating online instruction versus face-to-face -face instruction. I'm going to briefly tell you a little bit about that. And then I'm going to move on and tell you about the evaluation effort that we've set up at WashU. But I don't want to get your hopes too high with terms of that. We don't have data yet. These are in progress. So next year, maybe Janet and Bob will bring me back to present the results. They may or may not. I don't know. We're doing it every year, Mark. You're doing it every year. OK. Not necessarily the same topic. We'll have a different title. OK, Janet. That sounds good. Great. OK. So. Um, the U.S. Department of Education in 2009 conducted a meta-analysis of experimental and quasi-experimental studies that evaluated online instruction versus face-to-face -face instruction. And they, they found about 50 studies. About half of those involved blended instruction with face-to-face -face instruction augmented by web-based instruction. I won't talk about that. I went on this down to 27 studies that had a comparable in face-to-face -face course and an online module. These were comparable modules in these 27 studies. They almost always had the same instructor, but not always. The students were from the same population. And really surprising to me, some of the studies had random assignment. So at some universities, the students were, yes, yes, yet those studies are out there. Others did not. And when they didn't, uh, ability measures were taken prior to the course so that if uh, and it's almost certain ability is going to have some bearing on course outcome achievement, so those ability measures could be factored out statistically if there were differences between the two groups. And the achievement uh, were uh, uh, pretty much identical. The measures were achievement measures. They weren't student reactions. Sometimes they weren't, but those weren't, those weren't uniform. But uniformly, achievement was measured, and it was comparable. And what do you think happened? This is 27 studies, pretty good studies. Is online learning worse than face-to-face? -face? I've heard a lot of reasons why it might be. It turns out, what, why, okay, turns out there's no significant difference in these 27 studies, on average. And very few studies found any difference individually. Online's a slight tad bit better but not enough to talk about, really. They're, they're identical. They produce identical outcomes. Are they brought back to the same place to be tested? Are they brought? Well, I don't know, Bob. I didn't look all the, look, I just found out about this a week ago. <laughs> I, 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 I think I've done a pretty good job digging this up. <laughs> so I invite you to, I invite you to, not, yeah, right. No, no, I don't believe it is. I don't, but, I, but that's a good question. I know in one study that it was not. I'll tell you about that study briefly. But, but part of this uh, meta-analysis included, of the 27 studies I've talked about, 18 were circumscribed modules, and most, mostly for healthcare professionals, for continuing ed, to learn one kind of thing. So it could have been a procedure. How to administer a procedure. It could have been 
how to classify different kinds of patients, a classification scheme. It sometimes was about a particular medical condition, chronic pain. One module was designed for 4-H agents. I thought it was kind of fun. And another, not for healthcare, but that was one. And another module was for law enforcement officers. So, uh, uh, but, but these are kind of for continuing ed and, and, and add-ons to maybe uh, your usual curriculum. So there aren't many that have looked at semester length courses, which is, I think, our concern here, of the ones that were in that meta-analysis. Some are unpublished, some are paper presentations. But I have to say that there were a couple that are really good. So here's a study conducted in 2007. They had comparable materials. And this was set up to evaluate online versus face-to-face. -face. It wasn't an existing online course that was evaluated. This was set up as a true experiment. Students were randomly assigned to the two sections. The students agreed to do this. They were told, if you don't want to be in this experiment, we've got a third section you can enroll in. But if everybody agreed, they were randomly assigned. Small n, 18 in a group. The achievement test was exactly the same, Bob. And uh, I, I, I don't know how it was administered. It wasn't open book versus closed book. And the result was exactly comparable with the overall meta-analysis. No difference between the two courses in student exams and grades. Now, one study, that, uh, a couple studies that arise were conducted by our own psychonomes, Bill Mackey and Ruth Mackey. And I mention this because it, yeah, did you know, Janet, that they did some work? Yeah, yeah. Well, I told Ruth, I, I, pardon me, you didn't invite him, exactly. But I, right, but I, it's okay, Janet, because I saw Ruth yesterday. I said, Ruth, you've got to come. I'm really excited about your study. She said, I don't do that anymore. I haven't done that for five years, so Ruth's okay. So, yeah, she's, uh, no, she's okay. So, but this is interesting because it speaks to the theme here. Can't, what, how can we apply cognitive psychology to enhance MOOCs? And what, what uh, Bill and Ruth did is they had an online introductory psychology course that introduced advantages that can be exploited by technology that were not in the lecture class. And these were information-seeking assignments that you could do on the web. They were quizzes right after those assignments with feedback. They were distributed learning such that mastery quizzes were presented weekly with feedback and with explanations for why certain answers were right. So all of these would be things we would expect should improve learning. Quizzing, distributed learning, information-seeking kinds of assignments. And it turns out in several studies uniformly the online course was better than the lecture course in terms of achievement. Comparable exams, Bob, comparable exams. Uh, but again, it's not, it's not a comparison of online exactly administered as lecture courses. These online courses were enhanced. And they were enhanced in ways that we would, yeah, exactly. Jan, and that's why Janet convened this session to suggest we can do that. All right. Well, that was an aside, Janet, to show there is some research that suggests we can enhance these online courses. JEP applied. 2002 JEP applied. All right. So now let me move on to what we're doing at WashU, and uh, let me re-examine the wish list. Uh, this is not. This was not an experiment set up to evaluate the I, the issue. Is online better or worse than in class? Rather, we're handed online courses and asked to evaluate. A little bit more of a challenge, but it turns out the instructors are very cooperative, and three out of four are teaching a comparable in-class course and are allowing us to evaluate that as well. Um, so I can check that box. They, they're using similar syllabi, sometimes identical. The work required is very similar. The PowerPoints even that some of the instructors are using are the same in the asynchronous online sessions and the live sessions. And uh, so, same instructors, that's great. Unfortunately, there is no, the students are from different populations. The online course has students enrolling from the consortium universities that Roddy uh, listed up there. The face-to-face -face are all WashU courses. And of course, it's not random assignment. So that's going to be a challenge that we have to wrestle with. I'll tell you how we're going to do that. And the outcome assessments, again, this is purely because of the cooperation of the instructors, are fairly comparable. 
I'll tell you more about it. In some cases, they're identical. In some cases, they're not, but they're overlapping. And then finally, we've constructed an instrument to, to get students' reactions to the online course, evaluate the online course in a relative sense to face-to-face -face courses. So, Bob, how are we doing on time? Okay, good. So I'll dig into some of the details now. And this is, a, for me, the critical detail uh, is that the students aren't from the same population and they're not randomly assigned. So what are we going to do? Well, a common kind of thing that you can do is you can collect individual difference measures of these students so that it, it measures that you think are going to associate with the outcomes and then you can use those to statistically control for any differences. So what would those be? What would those be? Well, it turns out in the studies that I've looked at, it's not, it, it wasn't exhaustive, I know I only had a week, but it turns out that I don't see any evidence that people are using prior knowledge, except for the Mackies. And prior knowledge as cognitive psychologists, that dimension we would expect would be very important for predicting outcomes in terms of speed of learning, in terms of the richness of learning, and on and on. So what I'm able to do is I'm able, with the cooperation of instructors, to gather information about students' prior knowledge as they're coming into the online course and as they're coming into the face-to-face -face course. And Mackey and Mackey found that, uh, that measuring prior knowledge with a set of general psychology questions, uh, loosely patterned after GRE questions, predicted 20% of the variance in student outcomes. That, that's a pretty fair amount of variance. So this is going to be an important predictor. Well, I don't want, not a predictor, but an important covariate. And then ability. Everybody agrees ability is important. Mackey and Mackey used a verbal SAT proxy, and it turns out that that predicted 12.5% of variance in addition to prior knowledge. So these two together predict a third of the variance in student grades. So if there are differences in the two classes, I think we'll, we'll probably have a good handle on trying to uh, equivalently, uh, statistically equate the students. And then attitudes, it turns out, can be important. In the physics classes at WashU, our center is working on a, a, a project. We've got lots of data from three years. And the instructors gave the Colorado survey on student attitudes toward physics and physics courses. It's called the class. And it turns out that though some constructs in that class survey per, uh, associate with students' grades at the end of the course. So attitudes can be important. I, we're not doing, we don't have the instruments to measure attitudes in the various courses, but we have a short questionnaire <coughs> in psychology. Okay, so prior knowledge. Here's what we're doing in the environment and energy course. Uh, uh, the instructor constructed a 20 multiple choice fact-based um, uh, assessment, and he's, he's teaching the online course right now. 19 in the online course, 98 in class, they're comparable. And on this assessment, 25% about it are, are answered correctly. So there's low prior knowledge for this course, and I haven't done the stats, but just glancing at the means, it looks like it's comparable levels across the online and face-to-face. -face. So that's good news. In the introductory psychology course, the online course will not start until next semester, but the instructor com constructed a 25 multiple choice pretest on general psychology knowledge. And in the face-to-face -face course, we have data on that, 50 to 60% correct. So students are coming in with a fair amount of information about psychology. At least they can give us good guesses. But there's still room for improvement. Anyway, we've got those prior knowledge measures. I'll be interested to see what the online looks like. And in the computer science course, um, it's, it, it involves a lot of coding. And the instructor thinks basic algebra skills are very important for that. I'm still searching for a, an assessment for that. If anybody knows a quick online algebra assessment, I'd, I'd love to have it. OK. Ability, SAT scores, ACT scores, that's, uh, that's, that's uh, everybody would do that. But here's the kicker. It already turns out that in the online course for environment and energy, I've looked at the data on those SAT scores, and the WashU students are higher on verbal SAT, math SAT, and writing SAT than the other university students. So we've got an ability difference, which was the fear, but that's okay. We've got these covariates and attitudes. Not really much to talk about. We're asking people about their interest in psychology, the motivation for the course. Maybe, maybe that will have some bearing. I don't know. So how about the achievement assessments? Really good. In environment and energy, the instructor is going to use multiple uh, choice exams that are identical on research papers for both online and face-to-face. -face. 
For introductory psych, there's going to be an overlap of questions, but not identical. For computer science, the instructor is going to use 90% of the same questions on both items. And then finally, very quickly, we want to assess students' reactions. We're going to ask the students in the online courses to rate the online course relative to the other courses they've had in the university on the effectiveness in challenging them intellectually, the usefulness of the instructor's feedback, uh, and, and, and um, um, also how well the course accomplished objectives, and then ask them to rate what's the participation in class like online relative to face-to-face. -face. Uh, people think it's not as great in online. Uh, how well were they able to develop a deep understanding in online versus face-to-face? -face? Did they learn to collaborate with students online? In some cases, in these on the hook Google, maybe you could. Did they become interested in the course material? Most people say, we got to have college professors instructing them face-to-face because the enthusiasm that's conveyed really stimulates interest, right? Am I enthusiastic? Okay, so, so we want to we wanna look at that. And then, and then this is the thing that Carl Spooner talked about. The idea is that in these asynchronous situations, the students aren't paying attention as well. So we ask people, it's not this probe every five minutes, Carl, but we're asking them, what do you think about your attentional control uh, in the face-to-face -face or online? All right, so next year I'll give you the results. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. We've got uh, just a few minutes left. If, if you guys would come up to the uh, podium here, and uh, there's mics up here. They want everything to be recorded. Um, so questions about the uh, revolution that's happening or not happening. Here's the first one. Should I wait for the panel to? <laughs> Go ahead. You can do this, Mike. It's general, so. So, Mark, I have a question for you. How are you getting wait, the evaluation? Wait, wait, you're second. Who's ah. first? <laughs> second. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, are we not falling into a, I'm worried that we're falling into a false dichotomy here where uh, all learning occurs online or all learning occurs offline? My question is generally for the panel, what are your intuitions about the model that Jason Tangan and I are launching next year in the MOOC that we're running? Where there's one group of people, you can't hear? So. I can't hear it. I can't hear what you're saying. <laughs> so, what should I do? <laughs> <laughs> I'll speak louder into the microphone, is that That's better? Good. So tell me your intuitions about a model that we're running next year, which is where you have one group of people who uh, run the MOOC entirely online, and that might be students in a hut in Bangladesh who do uh, activities, there's video content, interviews, polls, which all happens online. A second group of students who actually enrol in our university, uh, but take the MOOC just as any other learner would, but then we spend our class time on campus actually doing things, uh, activities, debates, discussions and arguments, the things that I think we're really good at um, as, as academics. And then a third group that where we package the offline content as well as the online content into a textbook style. So you can actually run uh, the MOOC online and offline at a cafe with 12 people, at a high school or a university. So you, you create those, we repackage those online and offline activities in a, a textbook style thing. Mm -hmm. What are your intuitions about that in-between model uh, and is there any evidence that it would work any better than the two extremes? Uh, yeah, in the Department of Education meta-analysis there were about 23 studies that used what I would call the blended, what you're calling intermediate, where there was online instruction and there was also face-to-face -face classroom interaction, and those produced a significantly a better achievement outcomes than just face-to-face. -face. So the idea would be that probably there's a good chance that could be better. Yeah. We're, we're starting a similar thing. There's uh, someone, uh, someone at Columbia has uh, done a computer science um, 
online MOOC. There are only three at Columbia. But he has recorded lectures and he teaches the same class. So it's really interesting to look at those comparisons. What we have to do is get the Columbia students to enroll in, it, in MOOC form. So, yeah. but it's really interesting to see what combination could work. Yeah. I mean, it would be nice to have the combination. It, I like the Skype idea because it gives the potential to have whatever combination works maybe be more broadly available than to only people who are in the physical locale of your university. So, but I'd I th think it's exciting. The kind of comparison you're talking about is really interesting. Okay, great. Thanks. And Janet, do you still remember your question for Mark? Oh, yeah. Um, I wanted to, one of the problems with online is that they have to have, is testing. How do you make sure that people aren't cheating in the test? And in the first MOOC, they could cheat as much as they want. It was a completely open book. But how do you, how do you proctor when the guy's in India? It's, it's a good question, Janet. Um, the, the company we're working with, I yeah. think they have some ideas about that. Uh, maybe you can time each question. I'm not sure. It's a good question. Yeah. Roddy could have answered that better oh. because he's been involved in the See, design. See, I tried to ask him and Bob wouldn't let me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, he's... Yeah. Okay. The exams are administered through that platform, and the platform has it set up so that you can give only a specified amount of time for the exam, uh -huh. and so that it's one question per page, so that, so that as the student advances to the next question, it records when they moved on to the next question, when they made their mm -hmm. answer, saved it, and you can see if they spend 10 minutes on one question, they probably went and looked up the answer. So right? they have their iPhones sitting yeah. there, right? <laughs> but, I mean, it's a problem, though. If you have but, but I, Sasha generated something for me. I think in our situation, there's a proctor, and the people are on the Google, and they're wa the proctor is watching these people take their yeah. exam at their desk. Yeah. So that's the way we're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Another question? Okay. Um, actually, it's not really a question, but it's a response to um, this lady here. So I'm from Tamu, uh, Tamu Corpus Christi, and we uh, have our. Uh, learn first year learning communities um, and one of them is an online uh, taking the online tests through blackboard with all of the cheating things uh, in place and we just have a massive cheating scandal this uh -oh. semester yeah. where uh, there was a group of students you know higher ability students that were texting the answers um, you know, to each other, and there was a group of about, you know, 60 out of the 100 and some students. So I, I really hear you about the cheating thing, and it, it, it's, it's something that, um, you know, we're having to address now. <laughs> um, but even with the, you know, online Blackboard, we, um, they find a way. They find, they just find a way. They do that too, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we have way too many students to do that. <laughs> Yeah, we actually had, um, we tried that too, and um, we actually had a grade appeal problem where the administration is now telling us that every student has to have the exact same questions, otherwise it's not a fair test. Okay, people are going to have to go to the next session. I do want to read a note from Steve Jordan's, uh, please accept my apologies. I've been distracted waiting for my overdue granddaughter to arrive, uh, I think is... I think his daughter, uh, you said, had yeah, induced labor. His daughter recently. was nine. And, and I somehow nice thought parents. the event was scheduled for tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> but in any case, I want to uh, please join me in thanking our speakers. <laughs>
we'll see you next year at another Estes okay. Symposium, I guess. Indeed. Thank you.